Thank you very much. Um, I am here all afternoon, so if you have any questions, I'm very happy to, to stay and, and answer them. However, um, I must also say I am not um, the rapporteur nor shadow rapporteur on, on these dossiers. So these opinions are, are very much my own. On dossiers I've been working in that are actually ancillary to this rather than actually the, the shadow banking itself. Um, many of you will know I have done a lot of work on the general markets legislation here in Brussels. And so I think what I'm going to try and do today is to set a scene that um, having not read the, uh, the documents that came out on repos earlier, um, I don't know how many, have I a show of hands, who's, who's read the documents that came out? a couple of hours ago. I've skimmed through. Hey. Um, so my comments are, are having not read that document and, and referring to some of the other pieces of work that we're doing. So I'm going to try and set a political scene here. And it would come as no surprise to many of you that I actually am fairly um, diag diametrically opposed to many of the things that, that Saeed has been proposing in his money market fund. And I have no issue with CNAV funds at all and, and would actually go about uh, controlling runs on such instruments in a very different way and, and maybe find a more sophisticated method of doing it rather than banning them. Um, but I am a conservative member and I'm a former banker and fund manager. So maybe I have a slightly different perspective in terms of how we actually need to regulate the industry and how we need to regulate capital capital flows generally. But I think following on from what Graham said earlier, it's really important that we understand that the term shadow banking, I think is very, very misleading. It is actually an essential pool of capital that we need to be able to utilize to make what the, the politicians here refer to as the real economy function. And without it, we would be in even worse economic dire straits than we currently are in Europe. And we all need, uh, throughout the whole of the 28 countries, need to have major infrastructure investment. We need to find ways of actually getting our pensioners actually being able to fund their old age. All these things come together, and actually, these pools of risk capital are what is going to make us compete and make us actually be able to, to survive in the world economy going forwards. So, I really do regret the fact that somebody has actually called this shadow banking, because it may not be traditional banking, but I don't think it's any less important, and I don't think it's any less um, shady than some of the activities that go on within the, the formal credit institutions regulatory environment. So I, I think it's, it is unfortunate. I also worked on Dark Pools report, and the first question I had when I worked on the Dark Pools was, is it where you launder money? Um, so I think the whole connotation of, of dark shadows, these are really very, very unfortunate terms for politicians to then come into and to try and grapple with because they do suggest that there is something not quite right about them. So I, I, would, I would dearly like any of the academics in the room who want to change the title of shadow banking that they, they really have an opportunity to do so. But of course, it's not unregulated. Most of the activities are not unauthorized nor unscrutinized in, in the formal sense. And these are not local issues. They are usually global pots of money that actually pool activity to actually get return on investment for investors, whether they be short or long-term investments. And yes, there are issues. There are risks in the system. And the risks for me come from the interconnectedness of the formal banking system and that of, of what would be considered to be the shadow banking sector. And so those interconnections need to be studied. We need to know what the data is, and we need to know where the risks are. But actually, I would actually make an argument now that we've already dealt with the vast majority of that under existing legislation that we've worked on since 2009. Now, my argument is that actually we have got a serious piece of work implementing Basel III in the CRD IV directive, which actually regulates banks' activities. It doesn't just regulate the credit institutions, it regulates the investments and the activities that they're actually involved in. And many of the funds that we've been talking about and heard Saeed talk about actually get covered by that. And so disclosure is very much a part of CRD IV. And holding additional capital, actually discussing what level of liquidity is, is uh, desirable, what types of leverage should be used by these formal credit institutions, reporting what they have in affiliated entities is all at the heart of CRD4. Securitization is dealt with 
in CRD4. If you're a bank and you have any form of, of asset-backed securitization going on, you would actually have to declare all of that and necessarily hold the, any of the, the capital against it. So we have dealt with an awful lot of the interconnectedness with the formal banking system in CRD4, and many of the politicians working on the, these dossiers will not have done the work on CRD4 and may not realise how deep and, and how extensive that work really has been. Now, I keep reading in all the documents that I've actually um, had to my fingertips that um, this involves deposit takers. Well, funds are not like bank deposits. And anybody who thinks they're putting their money into a fund and they can't lose their money really shouldn't be putting any money anywhere other than the traditional bank account. Because investors, in my opinion, are not stupid. Investors know that there are risks associated with those investments. And ultimately, you need places in which you can put some portion of your savings in order to generate a return that is going to give you the, the profit and, and the income you desire going forwards. And many people are actually seeing that they need for their old age to actually take care of their own pensions and are actually looking to put money elsewhere. Others are putting it through the formal pension funds and then they're putting them into these higher risk entities. But the reality here is you don't put all of your eggs in one basket and it's already diversified. The number of funds out there, the type of investments is already extremely broad. So I don't think that, that funds are deposit takers in the traditional banking sense. And we shouldn't allow politicians generally to be talking about them as if they are deposit institutions. We also need to be really careful that actually we've also dealt with many of the issues of the insurance companies through Solvency II. And Solvency II was dealt with in the last parliament and has been picked up by this one. So it's a long time ago that the details were worked through. But for those politicians who were not aware of it, there was an awful lot dealt with about special purpose vehicles and needing to be authorised if insurance companies were using them. They, Solvency II is very much a risk-based regulatory framework. And so if they are investing in any of these funds and shadow banking activities, then they're already covered under that and very much a similar regime to the CRD4 for banks. So the increased reporting, the increased transparency that Solvency II delivers to the insurance sector is also huge. So you can start to see I'm building up a, a big map of types of legislation that already covers many of the activities and many of those participating in what is this shadow banking. But we don't really have a formal definition of shadow banking. So trying to work out what is covered and what isn't covered is actually a serious problem. So I would actually say to you that we've also dealt with an awful lot under MIFID, under CSDR and under EMEA. We have actually got global legal entity identifiers in place. We've got global trade repositories setting up. We've got reporting and transparency requirements for all market participants coming down the line. All of this will give us the data, will give us the information, will make sure that the risks in the system are known to the regulators and known to participants. All of these really do make a huge difference to the regulatory framework for the shadow banking sector. AFMD and the Money Market Fund dossier itself, USITS review, and of course when we do get solvency into place, all of these already regulate the activities of the shadow banking sector. So I would actually suggest to you, with the exception possibly, and given it's come out today, maybe it's just as well that I have made an exception of the repos market, and looking once we have the data, a collateral management stock lending extending into the repo market, we probably do need to look at that. But until we get the data after implementing MIFID II, we're not going to have that in order to do proper legislation. So we have to do this with evidence. We have to do it properly. And I have to say, I, I always say this, securities law legislation, without it, what are you actually regulating and how are you protecting investors? Unless you can guarantee people get their money back and you have a bankruptcy procedure that works across jurisdictions, then we're in trouble. So securities law legislation is far more important to bring forwards than many of the other dossiers that have been uh, touted with regards to shadow banking. So those are my wish lists in terms of please leave well alone. Um, uh, most of this is already being regulated under other dossiers. Let's let them all be implemented and bed down before we rush into any more legislation. 
get securities law legislation out which ties all of those markets related dossiers together and if you really want to, to finish the last piece of the jigsaw, recovery resolution of non-bank financials will go a long way to actually solving many of the shadow banking issues. Thank you.